Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Today is the 44th day since Sebastian vanished. And yesterday I had some information come across uh, my awareness, I'll say. And this information is very big. No matter who you are, like this is a big deal. So I'm going to make my way to that point by first showing some documents. Now, you may or may not have seen these. More than likely, you haven't seen them, but it's possible that you have. So we're going to go through just a, a few lines of this. This is part of the divorce, okay? The divorce between Seth and Katie. And this was Seth's reaction or Seth's, uh, what would we call it? Um reply sort of i guess to katie's so i'm going to share this with you right now okay in the matter of rogers attachment to dv reasons i do not agree i seth rogers declare that i am respondent in the above captioned matter and have personal knowledge of each fact set forth in this declaration if called as a witness i could and would completely testify within the bounds here too Petitioner Katie L. Rogers, here and after referred to as Katie, and I were married on June 21st, 2008, and still reside, reside together. We have been married for eight years and three months. We have one child together, Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers, here and after referred to as Sebastian, born December 7th, 2008. On or about August 29, 2016, Katie obtained a temporary temporary restraining order against me and had me removed from our marital residence. She listed Sebastian as a protected party and obtained a child custody order through the TRO, forbidding me to see him. There is a permanent domestic violence restraining order hearing set for se September 16, 2016 before this court. Since being served with the DV TRO, I have not violated the DVTRO and have had no impermissible contact with either petitioner or our son. On August 29, 2016 and September 8, 2016, I turned in the firearms I was in legal possession of to the San Diego County Sheriff's Office, attached here to as Exhibit A, are true and correct copies of the receipts and notices of confiscation. I've abided by the terms of the DR DV TRO, even though Katie's actions rendered me homeless. And that is one thing. He was, uh, Seth was actually homeless, I think, for at least six months around this time that the DV TRO was filed. Katie's request for a restraining order is based upon the following. I was highly aggressive in my mannerisms and I cursed and yelled at her. So it's not a basis for a restraining order under the facts. I was very angry, yelling at our son, and our son added, Daddy hit me, not a basis for a restraining order under the facts, as I never hit him. I've yelled at her and our son and slammed a door, breaking it, not a basis for a restraining order. As a result of these baseless allegations, I respectfully request the court deny Katie's request for permanent domestic violence restraining order. In full, there is no basis for her claims, and she fails to prove conduct under the Domestic Violence Prevention Act that would justify a restraining order. Incident of August 28, 2016. In her request for DVRO, Kitty claims that on August 28, uh, excuse me, 2016, I was being highly aggressive in my mannerisms and verbally, quote, watching it, watching her in her sleep. Okay. And I yelled at her because she's not willing to she is because she is not willing to beat her son. Not sure what we mean by that. Okay, this is not true. And even if it was, it would not be the basis for a DVRO. What actually happened on this day is that I was having a difficult time with our son. He refused to do anything I asked him. I asked him to clean his room and he replied no. And that he didn't have to listen to me or anything I asked him to do. And he told me I should apologize for asking him to clean his room. I attempted to appropriately discipline him by sternly telling him that no matter the circumstances, 
Should he ever speak to any adult, let alone his mother or father, the way he spoke to me? After this, Sebastian ran downstairs to Katie, jumped in her lap, and started saying he hated me. And that he wished I would leave and never come back. After Sebastian seemed to calm down a bit, Katie got out from the chair she was in and walked outside. The, and Sebastian approached me and told me he loved me and wanted to live with me after all. After this incident, I was very upset, but I was never violent in any way. Our neighbor was in the house and she said something about being uncomfortable. I told our neighbor I was going to just get some coffee and go outside to be alone. When I did, our neighbor followed me outside and asked me what was wrong. I told her how I was feeling and asked her to just let me calm down and compose myself. At no point did I act violently toward her or anyone else in the house, and I never yelled at Katie because he wouldn't, because she, excuse me, because she wouldn't, quote, beat our son. There was never any, let's see, there was never any, hold on a second. Okay, well. Here, we'll just go with this. This is not true. Even if it was, it would not be the basis for the DVRL. What actually happened? Are you? Okay, just a second, guys. Okay, I think I carry on from here then. Let me double check. Okay, good. All right. Um, this is not true. And even if it was, it would not be the basis for a DVRO. What actually happened on this day was that Katie and I were arguing about how we were going to proceed with our divorce. Our divorce has been filed and we were still residing in the same house, which created a tense situation. Although we argued. Just a minute. Although we argued, I never once violently acted violently and never once did I encourage her to quote beat our son, as she alleges in her pleadings. During our argument, I left the residence and slammed the door, but her claim that I broke the door is false. The door was already broken before I slammed it. Again, there was never any violence, nor was there any threat of violence. In a request for DVRO, Katie claims that on August 11, 2016, I was angry at our son and that our son told her that I hit him. The truth is that I never put a hand on our son. Our son suffers from a rare condition called 6Q27 chromosomal deletion syndrome. Among the symptoms he suffers from are incidents of acting out where he hits and bites himself out of frustration. He has been known to throw himself to the ground during these incidents. This is a very common thing for him and others have witnessed him doing this. I have filed here with declarations from some of these witnesses. Okay, everybody still with me? Good. So when I saw this line here about Sebastian, when he gets into a situation where he acts out and that he bites himself out of frustration and that he would throw himself on the ground, all of a sudden, I was reminded of those bite marks, guys, on uh, on Seth's forearm. And I'm not Seth. Excuse me. Let me say that over again. I was reminded of those bites on Chris's forearm. Let's look at them again. All right, so you guys can see these look perfectly spate. I, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but I'm so glad Smiley Stories brought those up during her live stream, her, her interview with them. Because when I look at these now, all I see is teeth marks. And they look, honest to God, like human teeth marks. They truly do. And so from there, I got to thinking about the kind of potential abuse that I believe poor Sebastian endured in that household. A very reliable source shared some information with me. I'm going to play you a clip real quick, and then we'll get into that. Society and not be part of the problem. Can we talk Don't. about that? Can we talk about the diapers? 
real quick. Sure. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. What's up with the diapers? Could you break that down for me? Because I've heard that many different times in many different uh, comments and, and, and chat forms and all that. Could you just ex explain a little bit about this diaper situation? Um, he was having accidents at school. And Chris got tired of Katie taking clothes to him to change clothes. So he made him wear a pull-up. Mm. Which is actually one of those things that happens to children that are abused. He would come to my house. First thing he did when he came in, I was like, take those damn things off. Go take a shower. Put on some underwear and some comfy clothes. Because we're men. We wear our boxers. We wear, wear our boxer briefs. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're not wearing pull-ups. And no accidents here. But when he would go over there, he would be wearing diapers. When he went over there, it got to the point where he was forced to bring a diaper over here. Or when he left, he couldn't have underwear at their house. Really? Chris didn't want him wearing underwear. Chris wanted to wear a pull-up. Chris got upset that I wouldn't enforce that at my house. What? My son doesn't need to be in a pull-up. My son needs to be treated better. Accidents happen. No doubt. All right. But it been months without an accident in my house. Real quick before we continue, I do want to give everybody a, a quick heads up. Please, guys, I have pinned it to the top. So what we have here is a situation where Chris Proudfoot more than likely was abusing him far more than he cares to admit. I mean, we know of the we know of at least one one incident. But honestly, I think there was so many more incidents than that one or two that he's actually admitted to. Because remember, on Nancy Grace, he definitely tried to minimize it quite a bit. So I got into a conversation yesterday with a very reliable source. Guys, I wish I could tell you who it was, um, but the, they want to remain nameless. So just take this as, you know, allegedly or speculation, whatever you want to file it as. But they're very reliable. What they shared with me was information about Chris Proudfoot and the great lengths that his family would go to to cover up for him. So the pretty much the conversation we were having, I was like, do you think, I mean, we, we know what, so a 15-year-old, autistic or not, wearing diapers, who is considered very high functioning, are we gonna consider that as normal or okay? That doesn't seem right. This is a kid who, in my opinion, at the bare minimum, he's being physically abused. But I even wonder, and, and this is what I brought up, I said, do you think he could be so weird as to like SA type abuse? And then I was told, well, Somebody, uh, how do I say this? Okay, in the past, let's say, and this is for sure before Chris was of age, so 18 years old. Not only did he SA his own stepsister, but he also did this to his cousin. And his mother, Kathy, covered for him. Covered it up however she could. And suddenly, it all started to make sense. Though these are women, or not women, these are females that in the past were victimized, is it possible that he didn't have any, I hate to go there, but any preference on this? Is he just an abusive type person? I was deeply troubled finding this out guys very deeply troubled the thing is is this family is is truly in my opinion a crime family like it, 
Terry, the stepdad of Chris, he has a history of, and not to say that drug users, all drug users are going to, you know, be shady and, and do unscrupulous things because they won't. But Terry Bowersox does have a history with some methamphetamine going back to, let's see, what was that? Charges, charges file. And, and this was a while ago. Okay. February 17, 1981. But then you've got, so probation violation in 2006 schedule. What is that? Four drugs, less than a half ounce. And that was, yeah, 2006. And then in 2011, so March of 2011, obtaining drugs by fraud. And then let's see, 4-13-2011, da, 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 obtaining drugs by fraud. And then the, what is this? May 23rd of 2006, unlawful drug paraphernalia uses and activity. Again, I don't, I don't want to say that just because somebody did drugs means that they're going to do other shady things. But that takes me to my next point. Check this out. Let me make sure you guys are seeing everything. Okay, good. So this was in one of the groups. So again, we can file this as speculation. But here's what was said. I probably have the missing piece to the puzzle. On the 26th, around 5.45 in the morning, so this would have been Monday morning, 5.45 in the morning, there was a SUV parked on the side of the road right past the country store on New Hope Road. I cannot 100% swear on the Bible, but the SUV looks just like CP, so Chris Proudfoot's mother's SUV. But if it is her vehicle, then the time ad adds up to when Sebastian's mother was about to drive to the school and look for him. I can almost bet my life that she met her up there and gave him to her. I done some asking around and found the landowner information and they just happened to have trail cameras, a few of them right in that area. So in the morning, I'm getting the cards and going to see if I'm right. A few people already know and Sumner County will know if what is on the camera is what I believe it is. CP's mother and stepfather are some evil people, and I believe with everything I love. It's going to turn out to be what I believe it is. There's six other people seen in that vehicle that morning, park up past that store and school, and I believe we are about to blow it wide open. As of recently, I have not seen... <clears throat> Just a minute, hold on. I have not seen any follow-up on this, but I found it extremely interesting. When I spoke to somebody in that neighborhood, remember they told me that when she left that, so shortly after she realized he had vanished, she leaves the house and she drives around. They say she came back pretty, pretty quick after that. As a matter of fact, hold on. I might have a video. I think I added the video, uh, some audio in here. Let me see if I can find it. Just a minute. Is it here? Just a minute. Let me see if I've got it on my phone readily, more readily available than this. Because I, well, let's listen to this clip. Hold on. So you guys saw uh, on your camera. I'm right after school on Friday. Okay. Um, on my video, about three, somewhere around three o'clock, get the mail on Friday. Okay. Then, um, they evidently had been out on Saturday because she comes home. She pulls up. He jumps out of the car and he um, gets the mail. And he, while she's pulling into the garage, he's skipping and he looks happy and he's running up to the front door. But then he doesn't go in the front door and he um, skips back down the sidewalk and into the garage. But okay. looks really happy. Mm -hmm. I did not. I did not visually see him on Friday with the camera. Okay. But Monday. I mean Sunday with my camera, but that was um, when I asked the police, well, my husband asked the police, yeah. did you see who took that trash down? Was that Sebastian? Mm -hmm. And they said yes, because in this neighborhood, if you want your trash picked up on Monday morning, you got to take it down there Sunday, yeah. sometime, Sunday. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's so you guys saw uh, on your camera. I'm right after school on Friday Okay. Um, on my video about three somewhere around three o'clock, get the mail on Friday. Okay. Then um, 
they evidently had been out on Saturday because she comes home, she pulls up, he jumps out of the car and he um, gets the mail and he, while she's pulling into the garage, he's skipping and he looks happy and he's running up to the front door, but then he doesn't go in the front door and he um, skips back down the sidewalk and into the garage, but okay. looks really happy. Mm-hmm. I did not, I did not visually see him on Friday with the camera, okay. but Monday. I mean, Sunday with my camera, but that was um, when I asked the police, well, my husband asked the police, yeah. did you see who took that trash down? Was that Sebastian? Mm-hmm. And they said, yes, because in this neighborhood. Okay, guys, I had you listen to it twice because I'm trying to find this clip, but it's not where I thought it was. Pretty much this individual told me that she had, that, that Katie immediately drove around the area to look for him. And so, you know, speculation, this is allegedly, right, and speculation here, but could she have gone over to this area where they're talking about in the in the screenshot I showed you on Hope Road, I think it was, you know, is it possible that maybe there was a quick, like a transfer or something? That's my speculations. I know it's a lot, but obviously something happened and somehow they have managed to completely throw off law enforcement. And either law enforcement right now is is playing into the lie, like, oh, and, and, and we don't suspect you kind of attitude. Or they really don't suspect them because they've managed to cover their tracks so much. That's the part that's just so confusing. Anyway, um, I wanted to go back. I want to listen to some of, do you guys remember when Duchess did her, I think this was her second interview. I found some interesting information in that. And what I did is I got a good clip of it. And I just want to go back and listen to that with you guys, because there are so many things that have come out in subsequent interviews that proved that the, these first answers were completely, he was, he was lying. He was straight lying. Chris was. So I want to go back and I want to listen to some of that. So we'll go ahead and I'll share that with you right here, right now. Uh, what happened that may be just finding out about Sebastian being missing. Can you walk us through uh, what happened on Sunday, like the before Sebastian, you know, went missing? Can you walk everybody through that and what led up to you finding out? Real quick, too, if I could have a mod put in Duchess's channel so that we can credit her for this live stream, please. For this clip, I mean. Okay, we'll go ahead. out that Sebastian was missing. Yeah. Um, Sunday morning, I'll just start at the morning. Sunday morning, we got up and I made um, a fun breakfast for us. Uh, spaghetti pancakes. Google it, y'all. Um, we FaceTimed family while we were eating so he could brag because that's something he likes to do. And um, we were laughing and joking on FaceTime and having a good time with that. Um, after breakfast, um, we got a call to go pick up um our niece and um go um take her to meet up so we we did that we went and picked her up and we met her mom at um bj's and uh we were there with um family members um we come home and put our groceries away and then a little bit later we went to the bowling alley a local bowling alley here and we played games and then we and this is just bubba and i and we went to dinner just the two of us and then come home um he took the trash out because that's his chore and um he come in and he was playing in his room until bedtime and uh at bedtime you know i, I told him i said hey bubba it's time to go to bed and he goes okay good night mama i love you and then he said good night to his puppies and um he went to bed okay and walk me through hang on i want to interrupt real quick so what she talks about there with the um the the whole good night routine first of all i have a 15 year old son no he is not a, autistic but in my experience he is the type that loves to like stay up late and when i go in and i say okay good night malik i love you 
Like, it's like, okay, see a mom. And then he's still going to be gaming or doing whatever it is he wants to do for the next couple hours. I mean, he's a straight A student. I trust him uh, like beyond words because he's just that good. So it's, it's automatically kind of hard for me to imagine that he, that she just says, Hey, it's time for bed. And he just goes to bed. Number one, that's hard for me to picture. But then the whole, okay, good night, mom. Good night, puppies. Like it's incredibly rehearsed. Yes, Christina. Yes, extremely rehearsed. Uh, okay, let's continue listening. It just made me think of that. Through what happened, you said that you were on a phone call, you were on the couch, and then you went to bed at midnight. Walk me through exactly what transpired during that time before you went to bed at midnight for you. So well, my husband, he works out of town a lot. So um, it, we normally sit and talk every evening and uh, I normally fall asleep on him. <laughs> um, and he'll, you know, he'll tell me, wake up, you know, you got to go to bed. And um, so, and that was right around midnight. Um, so I got up and I put the puppies up and I went to bed myself at midnight. And, um, you know, I, w I went to sleep, obviously. And then um, at 6 a.m., I went to wake him up for school and that's when I couldn't find him. And... Um, Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Take your time. Take your time. Tell me, did Sebastian take any type of medication before he went to bed or that would make him sleepy or did any, if he did take medication, it was just in the morning or did he take medication at night before he went to bed? He did take medication nightly okay. and daily. Um, okay. Okay. Just for HIPAA, for HIPAA reasons, we, are, we will not disclose. I understand. What is. I was just trying to think, you know, if there was some, there's that wonderful line for HIPAA reasons. We cannot give away that information. Like it's laughable for HIPAA reasons. Really? Are you in healthcare, Mr. Chris? Like what? Just ridiculous. Something that might have made him sleepy, like if he would have woken up, you know, I'm just all these different questions that people oh. have asked. So, right. but you don't have to disclose any particular, we, nobody needs to know that, you know, specifically. I just wanted to ask. Um, do you feel any particular way? Do you, do you have any thoughts about, about Sebastian's disappearance? Do you feel that he may have walked off? I've seen a lot of people in chat saying that he went out the window versus he went out the door. How did the door get locked? Um, that you found the door locked. Um, mm -hmm. Can you walk me through exactly what that looks like and what you found was the door locked. What do you think may have occurred for him walking off versus well, I tell you this. with someone? Okay. We, we didn't find any signs of the windows, but, um, I, and without disclosing the details of my door locks, I will say I that Sebastian regularly and consistently went out and locked the door behind himself. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me get over here because I have some other questions that are coming in. Um, what that looks like and what you found was the door locked what do you think may have occurred for him walking off versus well i tell you this with someone okay we, we didn't find any signs of the windows but um I, and without disclosing the details of my door locks i will say I that sebastian regularly and consistently went out and locked the door behind himself okay okay all right let me get over here because i have some other questions that are coming in um Now, I will say this much. Let, let them ask questions. I mean, we're not hiding anything. I've heard so much negativity that I refuse to answer questions. Let them fly. I mean, okay. I'll be respectful okay. of my responses. I would hope they would. So we have to ask ourselves, ourselves, why is the medicine such a soft spot for, for him specifically? Was it possibly because, you know, could they have been like overdosing him or... Not to jump to conclusions here, but I can see that maybe medicating him could be a, a helpful way to deal with maybe some of the parts that are not so easy to deal with, if that makes sense. So why is why does he get all weird about the medicine part, right? Makes you wonder. Would be respectful in their questions, but please let them fly. We're good with it. 
Okay, um, I'm just going to, uh, Crystal, Artic, do you have a question that you want to ask before I take a few questions from the chat? I do. I'm gonna, okay, go ahead. Um, we know that that Sebastian was high functioning, uh, had high functioning autism. Uh, what would you say was strengths and weaknesses that he had? Because no two kids are the same is why I'm asking. <laughs> that is, you, you are nowhere far from the truth on that because that is so correct. Um, Sebastian is extremely high functioning. He's, his weakness, he does not have a sense of personal space. Uh, they've always been working with him about like a three foot rule because he likes to be right up in your face. Hey, you know, whoa. He's, he deals with some social and emotional dysregulation issues. Mm -hmm. Simply put, he, he his emotions or responses don't always appropriately match the situation. Um, and, and socially, he can be somewhat awkward interacting with others because he doesn't always match like I don't know how to say it, right? Like it, someone will want to talk about one conversation, but if that's not the subject he's fixating on, he will just railroad over that and go right back to what he's thinking. Um, but at the same time, he's also, for the most part, a pretty happy kid and he loves being a helper and he likes, you know, he likes animals and he's really smart. Um, he can play in a game of chess and he's beat grown men in chess. He actually likes reading occasionally, but only if it's what he wants to read. Um, so like Minecraft books, um, he loves to read those. Um, albeit his humor is a little different. He's funny. I, I prefer he's silly more than anything. How is he with strangers? Depends on the day, to be honest with you. He goes either he's never met a stranger all the way to depending on his mood. He don't want nothing to do with anybody. So it's kind of difficult to answer that question because it varies depending on where he is in the moment. Okay. Normally, he, he's, he's, there's times he's not afraid to talk to people. There's times he is afraid to talk to people. Um, adults, maybe not so much, but children, he, he has no problem approaching children and talking. Um, for the most part. For the most part. Like I said, it, it, it's, it just depends on what mood and what day of the week you catch him. Okay. Artie, do you have a question you'd like to ask? I just wanted to know if maybe, thinking back on it, is there anything you can think of that seemed off or out of the ordinary prior to him going missing that during the night before you noticed he was missing? I honestly didn't notice anything that was like, oh my God, that's weird. You know, I mean, we, we had a really good day, you know, he wasn't in trouble at all. We went to bed on a good note and I, I don't know if maybe he just wasn't saying something, but nothing. And I've gone over this so many times I'm ill, but I didn't see or notice anything that was like red flag, you know? Okay. He didn't have any meltdowns or anything like that, that, that seemed off. No, he was actually really well behaved that day. He was even killed for the most part all day. Uh, can I ask the question? Uh, sure. Was was that um, unusual for him uh, no. to be well behaved all day? Not necessarily. And Sebastian goes through phases. He's got streaks where he's great, and then it's like he goes through remission. Yeah, like he, he'll screw up and he'll, <laughs> he'll get in trouble, and then he'll be good again. And he'll screw up. I mean, he's he's like a typical kid. Um, in a sense, but he just has autism, and I mean, it, it's but, hit or miss. But like, he'll be doing really, really great for a few weeks, and then all of a sudden, it's like he'll flip a, flip a switch. Sorry, and you know, and then we're you know we're working on you know going to the bathroom, and we're working on manners, and we're working on attitude, and then you know, and then we'll go through that phase, and then we'll go through you know, and he'll he'll flip the switch again, and he's you know doing really great. He just goes through. I understand you know, that completely. Like, trust me. <laughs> Can you guys imagine how much it killed Sebastian's spirit to to be 14, 15 years old, getting spanked with a belt? Think about that for a moment. He's, you know, kind of easing into adulthood here. And Mr. Big feels the need to spank him, you know, um, outside of his clothes on the buttocks. It's like, well, how would you like that, Chris, if we did that to you? How would it make you feel? It's just, it's unacceptable. And yeah, for him to be wearing pull-ups at 15, that says everything, guys. It's one abuse or the other or both, if you ask me. I'm not a professional, but that's what it sounds like to me. What does it sound like to you guys? We'll carry on. progress backpedal progress backpedal you know but it... now when i saw on social media um mm -hmm. some people were talking about um seth had spoken on um i guess it was um 
maybe it was the Pascal show that he recently spoke on. And he was talking about how um, at the end of the school year, Sebastian was supposed to come and live with him. Um, and can you tell us anything about that? Was, is there anything specific to know about that? I think a lot of people have been, you know, have been saying some very interesting things. Um, according to some posts that I saw, um, apparently it's because Chris, you are, um, that he's scared of you, that he's scared <laughs> of you and he's, and that you're bullying him at home. And I just, I, I hate, I don't, I don't like to ask. He chuckles. He chuckles as Duchess says, you know, he's scared of you. He goes, ha, 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 ha. really? Is that funny? No, that's not funny. How sad that a kid would fear his stepdad that much. The one that his mom chose to marry, that he would absolutely fear him. I think that's very sad. Ask these questions, but I feel I like prefer, it seems I to be actually, addressed I because I. I just want you to um, talk to us about why people are saying this and why people are also putting online that you have domestic violence charges. And I just wanted you to talk to us about that. If you, whatever you feel like you can tell us um, so we can try to um, reel that in. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Okay. To address every bit of this. Okay. So you mentioned Sebastian's afraid of me. Well, that is a loaded question because somebody who has released some information out there from another show who um, I won't put his name out there. Uh, allowed somebody to say something. Now, mind you, you, when you have a teenage child or teenage children, all parents know this, your children are not going to like you because you're not there to be their best friend. You're there to be a parent. And as parents, you have rules they have to follow. If they don't, there's consequences. Um, Sebastian will say one day he's upset and mad at me for something and 20 minutes later will run up to me, throw his arms around me, cry and say, I'm sorry and I love you. So, you know, when, when you get in trouble, of course, you don't like your parents. You know, he said the exact same things about his father. But that's when you set him down and said, look, bud, parents are parents. And we're going to have to do what we have to do. And unfortunately, you're not going to like it. But down the road, when you get older and if you decide to have children, someday you're going to look back and say, man, they were right. So, I mean, people have their opinions. They have their thoughts and their assumptions. And that's fine. I have never once stopped a person from having them. That's why we are people. That's how we are. But knowing the facts are one thing. And then assumptions behind what you want to put out there is something totally different. Right. You know, you addressed domestic violence. Okay. There are some folks out there who have decided to go online and go pull some public records, which perfectly okay with. Domestic violence. If I had domestic violence in my background, I wouldn't have certain credentials that I have because you're not legally allowed to. Um, domestic violence? No. I've had a temporary protective order and i had a no contact order placed against me in new mexico with my ex-wife now mind you let me back up and i'll play the whole story for you me and my ex-wife we actually lived here in tennessee for a little bit we had a daughter and at the time my daughter was only maybe six weeks old an event took place while i was holding my daughter and when that took place i filed for an immediate protection order against her we went to court the court made their decisions i gave my daughter back to her mother and when she received her, she jumped in a truck and flew right back to New Mexico, got to New Mexico. Within two days of being there, she turned around and filed the exact same thing against me in New Mexico. Mm. So everything that people are reading, it's on a court document. But what you don't read is the um, all the things that are happening in the court. You're not reading the transcript. So unfortunately, you don't know the full story. But right. if people want to ask, I'm okay to tell you. You know, um, Yes, I still have a current custody case going on in New Mexico that actually has absolutely zero bearing on this case with Sebastian. Um, I do ask people to refrain from bringing that up because it has no bearing. And all you're going to do is put assumptions and you're going to allow people to have uh, their speculations and, and bring out more false information. And it, what people don't understand is every time somebody puts something out there or they call into the law enforcement agency and says, the stepfather did it, you need to check the stepfather. Well, now you've just pulled a body away from the investigation because they are mandated to deal with that. Right. And I have told everybody from the very beginning, the TBI put a news link out, and in there it does state that all three parents have extremely been cooperative and constantly or continuously working with law enforcement. And they have there's absolutely nothing to show that we are responsible, foul play, any of that nature. People have asked about interrogations and polygraphs. All this stuff has been done. All of it has yeah, been done. 
Ah, wait till we get into this about the polygraph. Man, he really lies through his teeth, guys, about the polygraph. Here we go. That was one of the questions that I had up next was, have you both taken a polygraph test? The results are passed. Chris, can I ask something? Because I know that yes, people's going to ask it afterwards. The results are passed. Just so dismissive, like try to cover his little tracks there, huh? Like, okay, on to the next question. Yes, the channel, Miss CRN, is Duchess. Duchess is who did this interview. It's a it's a good interview, too. And this was pretty early on, like maybe a week or 10 days in. Eh, probably a little over 10 days in, I think. Um, <laughs> at the event that happened, was that toward you or by you? It was toward me. Okay. So, so to give you a... I'll go ahead and paint that story very crystal clear. Um, I was holding my daughter in my left arm. Okay. Mind you, she was a little baby. She was up against my chest, cuddled up next to my cheek and my shoulder. Um, my ex wife accused me of having an affair with a coworker um, who was not much into men. I'll let you go that direction wherever you want to go. Just wasn't into men. Um, and that coworker was my boss at the time. And she didn't like, and I was like, you're kidding me, right? And I showed it to her. She, and she's, She's very hot-headed. She didn't like the answer. Swore up and down I was. And she connected and slapped me across the left-hand side of my face. Again, if you're tracking here, he's talking about the Nina situation where Nina slaps him and then he gets a protective order and then it actually steals baby Faith from his wife. And, and baby Faith is probably, I don't know, six weeks old at this point. It's something, I mean, she's very young at this point. It's Horrific. Or I was holding my daughter. If you can do that while a man is holding a child or a woman is holding a child for that matter, if you can slap that person while they're holding that child, that says something about you. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have, I'm not going to be in that situation. I wouldn't expect any person to be in a situation of that. So I had to do what I had to do based on being a parent, which was best for my child. Right. I just knew that in the future that people would be online saying there was an incident and nobody asked what the incident was. Um, you and said sure, the results. I'm, I'm sure they're the results. Spin are, it. Yeah, the results of the polygraph was that you passed. Is that both of you passed, or can you say? Uh, yes. Okay, I think that was my that was my question. Liar, liar, pants on fire. There's a big fat whopper for everybody. Do I have to uh, roll that back a little? He's such a liar. And that was up since I see a couple people asking that specifically, did you take a polygraph test specifically? Chloe um, and Mo wanted to know specifically, could you elaborate? Did you take one and also pass? I've got a question. And a lot of people have been asking, Chris, is there any reason why you don't want Sebastian around your daughter? So I'm going to make this real crystal clear for everybody. There's some things that can be just can be spoke of and there's some things that will not be spoke of and personal issues inside my family are strictly that they have nothing no bearing on this investigation um the cops are well aware of everything mm -hmm. involving specifics and that's quite honestly i know this is gonna sound snarky and rude but it's really nobody's business as to that because it has no bearing on this case understood okay um and for the record i will say this all three parents have an agreement and we all understand this that can be got, done. It. got it okay and someone wanted to ask angela said i would like for chris to clarify what he meant when he said he hasn't seen sebastian since early february are you able to clarify and if you're not just state that so i cannot give certain details with this investigation and that's kind of one of those things okay. um i wish i could eventually down the road i'm sure that that will allow to come out okay but as it stands right now, the answer that I've given is early February was the last time that I saw Sebastian. Um, and no, I was not home when all of this took place. I actually got back to Nashville. And I believe it was it was later in the afternoon. But uh, I was on the phone with the police for the majority of that day until I physically got here. And um, a question that I've seen ask, uh, so I figured I wrote it down to ask you. Uh, why was the sheriff's office called and not 911? So I don't li our house is not designated for city limits, which jurisdictions for police are inside city limits. The sheriff's department is what 
governs our area because we're outside of that. So if you call 911 and you're outside of those areas, it goes to a central point, but then they will turn around and ask your location and then they redirect you to another dispatcher. If you know who the dispatcher, who your law enforcement agency is that governs your area, I just call them straight. There's no point in wasting time going from one to another to get to what I need when I know exactly who to call. And you guys were on a three-way call because you yes. were not, you were, you were coming from out of town. Is that correct? Uh, this, we were on a three-way call. Uh, yeah, that law enforcement was called on a three-way call. Is yes. that correct? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now, I said this in a recent live, but one of my very astute subscribers brought up the point that it's possible if they called on three-way to the sheriff's office versus 911, there might not be a record of that 911 call. In other words, location, you know how location is recorded from a 911 call? It's possible that they circumvented that whole process by calling the sheriff direct. Really something to think about there. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Carrie Dean wants to ask you if Sebastian could have been sneaking out prior without y'all knowing. I, I'm gonna, I would like to say no. Okay. Um, and the reason why I say that that is not Sebastian. He, he's he's not a child that just goes outside any at any point in time without telling somebody something. It's somehow that um, zero knowledge. Yeah, if it had happened, we don't know about it. Um, but our neighborhood is a very small subdivision. It's not it's not huge, uh, and everybody here looks out for everybody. We all watch to make sure everything's kosher in the neighborhood, and nobody has reported anything uh, of that nature. Okay. Uh, Crazy Linda asks, um, were there any weapons in either homes? And if so, were they all accounted for by law enforcement? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And um, do you all have camera footage in your home? I've heard people saying that too. Uh, that, is, that is some information that we cannot divulge at this time due to the on ongoing investigation. Okay. Boom. Did you catch that? They are asked if they have camera footage in their home and they cannot reveal that. Now think back to the Nancy Grace interview where she asked them about their surveillance and if they have any and if they have, what is it like lights and uh, what do you call it? Motion censored lights and things like that. Remember, they say they have no surveillance system in that interview, but in this interview, he can't talk about it. So what changed exactly? Thank you. Uh, we should did Sebastian, we can. <laughs> did Sebastian ha have a key to the house? And if he did, did he take that key with him? That is another part of an investigation that's ongoing that we cannot answer. Okay. Um, uh, can I ask the question I've seen? Whose ideal was it for Sebastian to move in with his bio dad after school was out? All three parents. And another thing that I've seen, and I mean, I understand if y'all can't answer, but was there also a restraining order on the biological dad? That was posted in a Facebook group yes. um, that someone sent to me. I think, no, that was something else. Let me find it. Someone sent it was, that to me. It was actually underneath uh, JLR's video. It wasn't in the Facebook group. Okay, so here's here's what I will openly say about that. Oh, there uh, it is. That's what somebody posted in the comments. So what I will say on that is this. People go through divorces, and it is, it is, it is not the best of times. So I was not pervy to that kind of information prior to my relationship with my wife, that was, that was. Hold on, I have to say, he says, I was not pervy instead of privy. I was not pervy. I caught that. I was like, well, he needs to say that, right? That sounds like strange. Anything happened that happened prior to my knowledge. So I cannot and give you an answer of that. But what I can say is, if it is out there, it could be a public knowledge, it could be a public record, but I don't have any knowledge of it. Okay, that's what I needed to ask on that one. Okay, going back over here to my questions. Guys, please, oh, I appreciate your patience, and they are sending me the questions, so um, I see that you guys are still posting more questions, and I'm getting to them as fast as I can, um, so thank you guys for being patient. Um, 
I do have four or five more um, messages that just popped up that said um, they want to know that you definitely took a polygraph and passed because it got cut off by a different question and you they feel like you did not answer that. So I'm just asking one more time. This is the last time, guys, I'm going to revisit this question. OK, for the record. No, he said he passed it, according to Angel. Well, hold on. Somebody asked the question, was a polygraph taken and has it been passed? Yes. I didn't specify who or when. But what I can tell you, everything has been vetted completely. Polygraphs have come back as passed. So I'm... Right there, he infers. Po okay, he says polygraphs have come back as passed. Keep in mind... Katie is the only one that has taken the polygraph. Seth has to take his uh, very soon. I'm, I think maybe in this following week or something. And Chris has never taken one. So he says all polygraphs have come back as passed. He's, he's skirting around the question. It's so obvious. Confused as in why they're all wondering if myself, my wife, and the biological father took one. When law enforcement agency has come out and told everybody, even in the TBI news link, if you guys hadn't read that, please go out and read that. That's got a lot of great information in it, especially it's probably the most up-to-date information. But they will even tell you. At this point in time, there is no – they have no reason to speculate foul play, anything on the parents. Everybody's been extremely cooperative of anything and everything they've asked us. Okay. And, Bobby, why did that happen? Because it's public – it's a public post. And these are questions that people are asking, and that is why it's up there. So um, before we go any further, we'll go back. And this is um, this is another I have had many questions about this, about supposedly Sebastian's grandmother spoke out last night. And um, he said uh, Trev apparently quoted her um, from some comments on a YouTube chat. Um, is there anything that that you want to say about this particular comment? Because I have been messaged multiple times about this Um if you want to address it, you don't. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. I just I, wanted to ask I, you. I, I will address it. I have, like I said, I, if somebody's refusing to address something that shows suspicion, I have no problems to address this. The grandmother, which is Seth, at that Robin is the name. She's Seth, biological father's mom. She made her statement on whatever YouTube channel. That's fine. Um, Thank you, Trev. What I can say on that is real simple. Like I said earlier in, the, in this podcast. Kids are going to say things, they're going to get upset because you're a parent and they don't like your answers. Um, Sebastian has said, like I said before, the same thing about his biological father. But when you sit your kids down and you explain to them that being a parent, you have to do things that they don't like, you know, unfortunately, it is what it is. We're not, as parents, everybody knows we're not to be our child's best friends. We're there to be parents. As a parent, your job in life is to make sure your offspring grow up to be better than we ever have been or get things better than we ever could get. And that's your legacy. That's our job. And kids don't like it. They're not going to understand because they're still young. Their minds are being molded. But eventually they're going to grow up. And when they have their own kids, they're going to look back and go, man, our parents were right. Because everybody that's an adult that has kids right now, not one person can say, no, he's wrong. Okay, so now you get a little bit of a flavor for Chris's. I believe that was his second if I'm not mistaken, his second interview he did. Duchess did a first and a second with them. Uh, I feel like the second was more of like digging into the details of what happened. The first one she did was more of like, okay, Sebastian's a missing kid. Let's know everything about Sebastian. And it wasn't so probative into who Chris and Katie kind of are and their behaviors and stuff like that. So Duchess interview number two, I thought was really good. Um, guys, I truly think that that three hour phone call is the alibi. What do you think of that? There's a period which happens to be almost exactly the amount of time it takes one to drive from Memphis to Hendersonville. What do you say? Three hours, 37 minutes is how long it takes door to door to get from where he was in his RV park in Memphis or around that area, to Hendersonville. So is it possible that he had some way of, uh, you know, maybe setting the phone down there at his place in, in the RV park and then driving and going and taking care of business? I will always wonder that until we have more answers. That's That's big to me. Anyway, the last clip I'll show... Do you guys want to watch a little bit of the hand interview? The the most bizarre interview of all. I 
just I've been wanting to watch this with you guys for a while. Let's just watch a little bit of that and then we'll close it out. But this one, if you've never seen the hand interview, it is absolutely strange. So I warn you ahead of time. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. All right. I E Proudfoot P R O U D F O O T. Chris C H R I S. Last name's Proudfoot P R O U D F O O T. So, I mean, first, just as parents, tell me what the last now over a week has been like for you two. Horrible beyond words. Um, this was an experience that I would have never dreamed would come can we first talk about how strange it is that only their hands are showing in this interview <laughs> literally all you see is katie and chris rubbing each other's hands it's reminiscent though of Letitia stout when she was i think on her very first interview she wouldn't allow the camera guys to get her face but she allowed them to get the back of her. So the whole interview you're seeing of Letitia Stout, she is it's just the back of her talking about Gannon and stuff. I I think that is just so bizarre. It's so weird. Okay, back to the interview. Honestly, I just, I can't put words to how hard this has been and how much it hurts not knowing where my son is, where, where he's at, if he's okay, just horrible is the best thing I can say. What about for you? It's rough. I mean, we are on day 11, no answers. And the horrible things that people say just keep rolling in, regardless of taking time to consider the facts and you know, assumptions is what they're going off of. But, you know, for us, it's, we sit here and we wait, we wait and we wait and hopefully we'll get an answer or hopefully he walks through our door, which would be amazing. I was going to say, how badly do you both want Sebastian to just walk through that front door to get that call? I'd give anything. In a heartbeat, I would give anything. There's not, it's not measurable. It's, Put it that way. There's no measurable. Anybody says all oh, it is. You've never said anything. What do you guys notice about right here? Though we cannot see much besides just the hands, besides the hands, what's something you guys notice? Throw some stuff out, and then I'll tell you what I notice. Don Wells. Oh, that's funny. What I notice, guys, is I don't see her swaying back and forth, forward and backward. And though we can't see all of her in this instant, I don't see anything indicative of her swaying back and forth. Oh, and Dee Dee says no ring. You're right. Chris is not wearing a ring. Interesting. Okay, we'll carry on. Choose. You've never been in this situation. And I don't ever wish for people to be in this situation. And what, what's Sebastian like? What's his personality like? What does he love to do? He, for the most part, is happy. He likes to laugh and joke and tell you all about everything. And then some, um, he loves games. Uh, he loves video games. Um, he loves to play with his Legos, um, even building things uh, with me. We, we build little projects here and there, but um, he's, um, he's always a character. Are there any, like, 
weird tendencies that he has that might be able to help people find him in this search? I don't know how helpful to finding him, but he fidgets <coughs> constantly. He loves shiny pennies, paper clips. He's always like, uh, whenever we go to the grocery store. One thing I'm noticing as she talks, she's not doing her Southern twang thing she normally has. If you'll notice when she starts giving the rundown of the story, the official, you know, her story, she'll always have kind of like this Southern, like kind of Southern draw. But if you notice right here, when she's just talking about Sebastian, she doesn't have that Southern draw at all. Now we'll see as they get more into the story. You might hear what I'm talking about. Um, he always looks on the ground and looks under the register counter, and he's always looking for shiny pennies everywhere, um, paper clips. He loves to bend them out of shape and play with them, fidget with them. Um, he loves playgrounds. Um, I mean, we've said it before. He likes fishing and, and things like that. but um, Cats. Boy he, loves cats. He does. He loves cats. It's his favorite animal. <laughs> um, I don't know. He's just... He's a good kid. There are no leads. Nothing caught on video. Your son has been missing for 11 days now. How does that make you feel as parents? I I mean, I don't have words to describe how I'm feeling right now. I mean, I, every day is harder than the last. I mean, we're out, we're looking, we're, we're trying to make sure that everyone stays looking and doesn't let his face fall to the bottom of a feed or or get covered by some other nonsense. I mean, I just, we just want our boy home. When you walked in Monday morning and didn't see Sebastian in his room, what was your gut reaction? My very first reaction was, oh, he got up and got breakfast. <laughs> um but when I realized he actually wasn't in the house, I've never experienced sheer panic in the way that I did. And basically for every minute since that um, not knowing where your child is, is a pain that um, I've never, I've never known pain like this before. And walk me through the events that happen, you know, from Sunday leading up to Monday when you didn't see him that morning. Okay, let's play, let's pay close attention to if she gets that little Southern draw thing again. Cause I know I heard it in Olivia's interview uh, with the Proudfoots. I've heard it in other subsequent interviews. Let's see if we hear it now. Sunday, uh, we were out and about. We had a, a really good day. We were out um, doing our thing, running around, you know, we had dinner that evening. And when we came home, uh, we had a pretty good evening together as well. Um, he was playing right up until bedtime. And then some, I let him stay up a little late. Um, and when I told him to go to bed, you know, he's like, I love you, mom. I love you puppies. And, uh, he went to bed and, um, I went to bed around midnight Everything seemed fine. And uh, when I went to wake him up for school, that's when I, I couldn't find him. He wasn't in his room. 
and he wasn't in the house. And that's when I panicked. And when you panicked, uh, what'd you do? First thing I did was call my husband and um, I said, he's not here. My husband said, what do you mean he's not here? I said, he's not in the house. And he said, you know, immediately just started, you know, did you check here? Did you check there? Did you look here? And uh, I ran through the house. And um, at that point I was hysterical for lack of word. And uh, we called, we, we three-wayed the, um, the police. And um, I, I'm within minutes, they were here. I couldn't tell you exactly how long. I know it was fast. Um, and we haven't found him. When I got the phone call that he was missing, um, like she said, we asked questions like, where is he at? Check this, check that. And then we called the sheriff's department. I called the sheriff's department. I stayed on the phone pretty much most of the time. Um, and then I, while I was at work, I asked for a relief, got a relief, got in my truck from Memphis. Now, according to what I heard very recently, according to the city ordinance of this Memphis area, there's a good possibility he wasn't able to be at work at that point anyway. So I think some of his story might be absolute malarkey, guys. It's crazy. And made my way to Nashville. And that was, I guess, Monday? The morning that he was missing, yes. Okay. And um, so what was your reaction when you got that call from your wife that Sebastian was missing? Initially, I was like, oh, he's he's goofing around again. Here we go. He's like hiding and then when we talked about the places to check and he's not there, I was like, okay, stop instantly. Call the police instantly. I'm a black and white kind of guy. I, so. And to your knowledge, he didn't take shoes with him, right? He locked the door on his way out. Or I guess what are some of the things that you think he did as he left? We checked for all of his shoes and none of them are missing. Um, the door was locked. And what was there some discrepancy as to what he was wearing when he went to bed or what was he last seen wearing? What, what was he wearing to bed that night? When he went to bed, uh, he was wearing black um, sweatpants with white stripes down the side. And he had on a black, long sleeve black shirt with a print on the front. I'm pretty sure it was one of his. Um, uh, like Star like, Wars or Halloween or. Um, or even Minecraft. Yeah. Those yeah, are the three main it's things. the three things that he's. Majority is on his clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boy, he has his flavors. <laughs> And obviously you guys are going through the unimaginable and then, you know, getting a lot of like the kickback that you've seen on social media. I mean, how much worse has that made it for you two to go through something like this? Honestly, um, we stopped looking at it. There's a lot of terrible people in this world and I don't want to waste energy on any of that. I want the focus on finding our son. The facts are the facts. I mean, the, the police know the facts. And all I want, all I ask of anyone is if they're able and willing is to help find him, help spread his flyer, help look for him, call in if you know anything or see anything. But... We just ask that people focus on finding Sebastian. And he's never done anything like that before, right? Just kind of walked out of the house. He's not a runner. Um, this is this is not normal for him to run away. Um, if, I mean, I just, he's, no, he's not a runner. And any places, I guess, I know you, you guys have been told to stay in the house, right? Just in case he comes home. 
we we are doing what we've been asked to do by the law enforcement agencies. And this is an important part, in my opinion. By the way, hi to you, Rev, if you're still in here. Um, they the interviewer asks, so you guys have been told to stay in your house, right? And now he responds to that. Because keep in mind, guys, right now they are not in the home. They're in an RV uh, or a fifth wheel somewhere. I Last I heard it was at that Yogi Bear place in uh, Mississippi. So take notice to what she says or what they say here. Everybody involved. I am not going to divulge anything more than that. But if you, what I'm trying to ask, I guess, next is if you were to go out and search right now, if people want to help search, what types of places would you guys look at that he can maybe be at? Anywhere and everywhere. At this point, there's... It's been 11 days. He could be anywhere. Yeah. They've searched the woods. They've searched parks. They've searched creeks. They've searched, at this point, it, it anything and everything. Anywhere that he could search. be staying out of the weather or, or getting food or, I mean, honestly, at this point he could genuinely be anywhere. How hopeful are you too that he will come home? I will never give up hope on finding my child. Optimism is at its highest our, regardless. Our son is out there. We're going to find him. And now just, I'm it's an affront to all of us when she refers to Sebastian as our son. That is not Chris's son. It, it, it grinds my gears every time she says our son is out there missing. And by the way, Katie, if your son's out there missing, is there a reason you're not looking for him? I mean, he could be anywhere, right? So why aren't you out everywhere, as you say? The actions speak louder than words, and their actions say that they know exactly where he is right now. I mean, publicly, like obviously police are now investigating a landfill. People are speaking out about that. What are your thoughts about that? Everybody has an opinion and their assumptions, and they are entitled to those. But as I've stated before, all we've asked people to do is to look at the facts, not what everybody's putting out there. If they have questions, call the law enforcement agencies and they'll give you whatever they can give you. But the assumptions are just that they are an assumption, your opinions. We pray for everybody for hopefully this never happens to you. And if it ever does, then you'll understand. But I pray it doesn't. And they're doing their job. They're looking everywhere they can for my, for, I mean, their goal is the same. We just want to find him. If you could say something to Sebastian, if he's listening right now, what would you say to him? I would say that we love you and we miss you and we want you to come home. And just know that, that we all care about you so much. You're not in trouble. That door's unlocked and waiting for you to come home. Your puppies miss you. Your family misses you. I miss you. Just come home. And anything else that you two want to add or clear up or anything like that? Okay. Just help us find our son. Can I want emergency? What are you reporting? I didn't hear the Southern twang as much in her voice. I real quick. I want to look at Chronicles of Olivia and then we'll close this out. I just, I'm dying to show you guys what I'm talking about. So hang on a second for me, if you would. I interview the mother and stepfather of Sebastian Rogers, a 15-year-old 
who vanished from Hendersonville, Tennessee on February 26 of 2024. He vanished and hasn't been seen since. Although he doesn't like to be dirty, it's kind of funny because he also doesn't have awareness because if you look, he's got chocolate milk on his face because he didn't like it off at breakfast. It's funny like that. Can you recap the overall story of Sebastian's disappearance? Kind of walk through that day. Um, Sunday, the day before he went missing. Um, Real quick, mods, if you could please put Olivia's channel in the in the comments, just so everybody's got it in case they want to go watch this interview afterwards. But basically what we're going to do for a moment is, is watch a little bit of this interview. I'm trying to find the best example of when she pours on the Southern draw. So let's listen. We got up and fun fact, I made breakfast that morning. <laughs> um, we had a good time. We were laughing. We were joking. Um, we talked to family on the phone during breakfast to brag. Um, we went and picked up our niece. Yes, uh, yeah, I got a call. And um... first thing I have to bitch about, why is she looking at him when she tells her story? Guys, I'm trying to turn it up. This is as high as it can go. I'm so sorry, but hopefully you can hear it better now. Uh, but yeah, she's looking over at him. And I know everybody's probably had the same exact feedback here. But if he was not there that day, is there a reason why she's looking at him to get the next part of the story like fed to her? It's very strange. Asked if I could go and pick her up, and I did. And so um, we went and did that. We went to BJ's. Um, had a good time there. He ate a colossal popcorn. Um, came home to put groceries away because we bought snacks because, you know, he's 15 and snacks. Um, we went to the bowling alley. And then from there, we went to dinner, came home. Um, he took out the trash because that's his chore. He takes the can to the end of the driveway. Um, about nine o'clock, told him to go to bed. And he's come out of his room where he was playing. And he said, all right, good night, mama. Good night, puppies. I love you. He went to bed. Um, he was doing something in his room because about an hour later I heard some noise and I was like, I don't care what you're doing in there, but go to sleep. And um, about midnight, I got up and I went to bed. And um, six o'clock, I went to wake him up for school Monday morning. And that's when he went in here. What was going through your mind at that point? Like, What were the feelings that you were feeling to censor myself. Holy freaking crap, this can't be happening. Where is my kid? Choice words were used. Um, like, you know, where the F is he? You know. Um, I had called my, I had looked through the house for him because it was typical for him to get up and come and rummage for snacks and things like that. And he likes to dip behind the, you know, walls and watch, you know. And, um, and then he comes out after I come back and he likes to scare me. <laughs> but um, after I looked, and I mean, mind you, all of this took place in like one minute flat, but um, I didn't see him in his room. I looked all over, I ran through the whole house. I looked out all the doors and windows and I was like hollering his name. And um, I picked up the phone and I called my husband and I said, um, I can't find him. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he's not in this effing house. I can't find our son and um i like i jumped in my car and i drove around the neighborhood and i drove over by the school and he's already 
like I, at this point I was like hysterical and I was crying and I was screaming and um, <coughs> he was like um, uh, three way he three wayed law enforcement and um, was telling them like our son is missing and we don't know what's going on and he like he was like go back to the house they're on their way and I ran back well, drove back to the house and um, 20 days later they really found him yeah I can't even imagine how stressful that is and also um like when we were driving up here like this neighborhood is so pretty and nice and um do you think has he ever like walked away before or, like has that ever happened it's just no no um, first time. he's not a child that wonders he's not one that is prone like he doesn't have a history of being no. an eloper, which is common. And I have friends with children on the spectrum who do struggle with elopement with their children. But no, Sebastian, that's one thing. He's always been a blessing. He's not been an eloper or a runner. Um, Again, I say they really box themselves in with these answers. Uh, he's not a runner. He didn't talk to anybody on the internet. He didn't have internet access. And it goes back to what Seth said recently. I think it was on the Pascal um, interview he did where he's like, no, he's basically like a Jedi. And he just floated out of the house. You know, it's like they have boxed themselves in with these answers that don't compute. They make it so that it's impossible to say that the kid ever ran out of there. Well, well, how did he leave then? And then there's no smell of him, no scent of him either. So it's like, it makes it impossible to follow their story. And yes, this is to me, in my opinion, this is a hundred percent a fabricated story. And it goes just like the whole flowers story with the Summer Wells case. Like they hit each and every bullet point and then that's the story. You know what I'm saying? It's it's incredibly frustrating. Let's keep let's keep listening though. His his primary areas are like social and emotional dysregulation issues and things like that. Um, but he's very smart. He's functional. Um, overall, he's a pretty happy kid. I mean, he's he's a teenager. He's coming into his hormones. He's angry that he's growing a mustache but um for the most part he's a happy kid and um what are your theories like i'm sure your mind has thought of every possible thing that could have happened but is there any theory that you can talk about that you think what i can tell you is with all law enforcement with everybody that's involved there's Nothing that's been eliminated, everything is on the table. Everything is being looked at from every possible aspect. Um, everything from he got out and walked away and was outside of the search radius before we started searching to the worst. Yeah. And, and that's currently where we're at. I mean, it's... Yeah. Really trying not to go down that road because... When We're going to find him. Speculating causes problems. Assumptions cause issues. And based on facts of what everybody knows, right now, there's nothing. And everything is still on the table to be looked at. I just know he's out there somewhere. What troubles me quite a bit is that Katie never makes eye contact with the interviewer. And I don't know if maybe that's a normal thing in grief, if, if that's the case, but it makes her even less believable as she tells the story because it's like she's looking down for like confirmation that she's telling the right story or the right, the right parts of the story. Yeah, I, I think it is, Susan. It's, it could be guilt very much. Now, I remember the first time I saw this interview, it was very early into my quest to try to figure out like what happened to him, you know, what my theories and stuff were. 
And when I saw this interview the first time, I thought, well, maybe these people are just misunderstood. You know, they they don't seem that bad. And but it was honest to God, it was the lies that came out between like the Nancy Grace interview, the Smiley Story interview. It was this different telling of, of the story that really got me. A hundred percent got me. And, and knowing that they would lie about the little things when a kid is missing makes me see that they would lie about the big things. And that's what I have a problem with. And that's it's in that whole situation is when I realized, I think these people are covering up for something much more sinister. Yeah. Her face is very telling reality wins. Yeah. One other question I have is recently channel five in Nashville, they had security footage that showed two flashlights um, the night he disappeared. Is there anything um, that you think about this video or? Sure. So there's a lot of speculations about that video that are floating on the internet. Hold on. Do you see this? Not, not once is she actually looking at the interviewer at Olivia, not once. That's weird. I actually didn't catch it this before. This is really strange to me though, as I catch it now. Internet. Okay, and that is exactly what it is, it's speculations. Now what I can give you an official statement on is TBI Newslink has released a statement from law enforcement, between local law enforcement, state law enforcement, some federal law enforcement, and they have analyzed that video so many times over that everything that everybody is trying to assume is a flashlight. I'm, I hate to say this. It's not as much as we would love it to be one. It's not. Um, I'm not going to go into details as far as where that video is shot from, but I can tell you as the parents, we have seen the video firsthand from law enforcement. We know exactly where it was taken from and nothing that is being assumed right now is actually true about that video, unfortunately. Okay. And anything about other, any other videos or anything like that, please refer to the TBI news link that they have out there, the Am updated Amber Alert stuff, and it will give you the most up-to-date information that all in, uh, law enforcement has and they will give you current as far as what's what and how they're looking at things and if there's any new video for it to them please yeah um security footage is really like a game changer um we're working on riley's strain and trying to find like if someone missed one on a corner or something well, that's Around this neighborhood. Um, I'm sorry, but it bugs me. <clears throat> it bugs me that they don't seem more concerned about where Sebastian is. There's, as somebody in the in the chat just said, flat affect. That's a hundred percent what I'm saying. There's no no excitement to this. What I mean by excitement is there, there, she's literally flat. There's no feeling, there's no um, urgency. There's nothing about her behavior that says, I've got a missing kid and I need to find him. And that, I think that's what bothers me the absolute most. Anyway, guys, I won't play the whole interview. I, I know that, you know, it's probably best to go view it on her page so that she gets the viewership. But I really appreciate everybody being here today. I've wanted to go over these interviews for a while, and I'm glad we got to actually do it. By the way, thank you, KT, for becoming a new member. I really appreciate that. And guys, there is um, a membership you can join like she just did. And the links will be in the description. I've got all, all sorts of different links to support the channel. But thank you, everybody, for being here today. And please hit the like button on your way out. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Take care.